Wedgeside Podcast is a proud member of the Wedgeside Media Collective. This week's episode is sponsored by our Amazon affiliate link. It's super simple how it works. All you have to do is head on over to witchsidepodcast.com, click through our Amazon link, and anything you buy through Amazon, we get a little kickback for. You can even use it on our website to search for things. It's <laughs> fancy like that. There's there's also a direct link in the show notes right now if you're lazy. That's probably the easier way to do it. Just click on that. You know, just click save it as a favorite. So every time you go to Amazon, just go that way through it, and we get a little kickback. And if you're already planning on going to Amazon, which, let's face it, we all buy shit through Amazon, right? If you're already planning on it, it just takes a little bit of money away from them. You can use it the same way you'd normally use Amazon. Just click through the link. If you're looking for something to get, I just got Betrayal at House on the Hill for my birthday. And it's super fun. It's a tabletop game. And it's really cool. It's like a survival horror B-movie game. It's fucking fun because it switches from like communal play to then like individual play the, and like you're against each other it's it's way fun go to witchsidepodcast.com click on the amazon link we get a little they get a little less This is episode 146. Yeah, we talked to Kevin Chase from Beagle Freedom Project. I love this conversation. Um, it kind of came up that in the early 2000s, I, I met Kevin at a protest. He was super inspirational then, still super inspirational. Um, just a really good, fun chat. So stick around for that. Hey, Jordan, what news and events do we have going on? Well, here in Utah, in case you hadn't heard... Two people were cited for protesting on a sidewalk without first filing a $50 free speech fee. Yeah. It's that fucking ridiculous. And the law is so, so vague that if you promote an event or you... Which is, which is ironic because we actually promoted the event that they got they cited for. Whatever. So, yep. Um... Nicole and Joseph are still looking for donations for their legal defense fund. They could really use your support. Hit them up. Crow also definitely needs your support. And you should look her defense up as well. In Denver, you have your Anarchist Movie Night on August 26th at 8 p.m. And here in Salt Lake, you got your August Vegan Drinks and Potluck at 7 p.m. on August 29th. If you're not in Salt Lake and you want to attend to vegan drinks, just look them up. They're hosted all over the place. But if you have an event going on in your neck of the woods, drop us a line. We'll throw it out there for everyone. whoop What time is it? It's slingshot time. August 24th, 1967. Abby Hoffman and Jerry Rubin threw dollar bills at the New York Stock Exchange. <laughs> they just threw... What did they do? They just they threw went to the New York Stock Exchange and started throwing dollar bills everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a good time. <laughs> uh, if you're not familiar with Abby Hoffman, he wrote still this book. Uh, so yeah. Anyways, I like that little tidbit of history. If you like these tidbits of history, we pull them out of the Slingshot Personal Organizer. Get one. They're amazing. And they're an awesome collective. You can get one at a local info shop or an online info shop like AK Press. They don't pay us to say this. We just like them. I mean, I would like it if they paid us. They're more than welcome to pay. More us. than we won't we won't turn down their money, if, but I love them anyways. I sincerely hope you enjoy this episode.
Oh, so anyways, how's your day going? Pretty hectic. How was yours? You know, eh, pretty yeah. hectic. <laughs> All right. So, so, um, let's do this. Yeah. So, so you you said your day's been going pretty hectic. What makes it so he- hectic for you? Oh, I'm going to Chicago tomorrow morning for a fundraiser, and I have to meet one of our board members tonight. Uh, the other side of town. Um, somebody's parked in my garage, in my spot in the garage, and so I'm a little nervous. I took somebody else's spot, waiting for them to move. If I'm going to get in trouble, and then all sorts of things. We filed a lawsuit today against Texas A&M, so I just issued a press release, and so we're fielding some calls for that. Um, or we're working with an inspector right now to appraise on a property we're trying to get for the rescue and outreach center. So there's just a lot going on today. So what, what lawsuit did you file today? Um, we're suing Texas A&M for their non-compliance with open record requests from people in our identity campaign, seeking public records and veterinary reports and censuses on individual dogs held in this lab, which is a taxpayer subsidized laboratory. And we have rights under the Texas open records request laws and under federal freedom of information act request laws that we should be able to inspect and have copies of these reports. Unfortunately, Texas A&M is reproving very reluctant and recalcitrant to turn them over. And so we're gonna sue them now to compel them to turn it over and then compensate us for the time we have to spend on the lawsuit. So you want to kind of explain what the identity campaign is? Sure. Is, are we doing the podcast right now? Is this going to be cut and edited or is it just like a live stream? It, it It's pre-recorded. So anything that you want to take okay. out, we can take out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, the identity campaign is a novel project by Beagle Freedom Project that for the first time in U.S. history that we know of, we're crowdsourcing open record requests to taxpayer-subsidized research at universities across the country. So we identified over eight months of doing our own records requests the identities of about a 1,000 dogs and cats in U.S. laboratories, and we have their individual tattoo numbers, And we are working with people and supporters and families across the country through this virtual adoption campaign. So much like you see on TV where you're asked to sponsor a child in Africa or Guatemala and provide, you know, um, resources for them and look out for them and learn about their lives in the process. We're doing the same thing with animals still in laboratories right now and assigning each individual adopter with an individual animal that they're responsible for, that they need to file records requests on, get the research that's being done on them, the veterinary reports, and help us identify opportunities for post-research adoption, or also identify where the research is redundant, unnecessary, incredibly violent. Um, And so we can... Uh, file NIH complaints like we did in Ohio this week, or we can offer a scientific criticism of the research, or we can work with the laboratory to ask them politely and and uh, in full earnestness to let us work with them to find homes for these dogs and cats when the testing on them is done. Although we're opposed to the testing, we can certainly find common ground with those in the animal testing industry looking for um, opportunities to find homes for dogs and cats they don't need anymore. And so that's the identity campaign. Um, it's proven really popular with our supporters and really unpopular with the laboratories across the country that are fielding, you know, hundreds upon hundreds of requests for information on individual animals. A part of the appeal of the campaign for me and for a lot of our supporters is the psychological aspect of it, that We're providing names to animals and laboratories they prefer to and actually only refer to as numbers, the numbers tattooed in their ears, and we're giving them names and making sure that they're known as individuals because it becomes much harder to subject these animals to violence and um, think of them as furry, abstract little test tubes if we only call them by a number. 
And, you know, history is rife with examples of this where we reduce people to numbers when we want to perpetrate violence and acts of oppression against them. And it's the same thing for animals in laboratories. And so Texas A&M has been one stubborn school that's refused to re comply with the law and give people access to public documents about what's being done in their name with their taxpayer dollars to these dogs and cats. And so today we sued them and we know we have the law on our side and we expect to prevail and we're going to use the lawsuit as a vehicle to elevate and provoke a public conversation about animals used in laboratories, the same way we use the rescues to begin with as a way of provoking the public to remember that there are still 65,000 dogs, 20,000 cats, and countless other animals still languishing in laboratories. So you mentioned it's like the campaigns that you see, like um, adopt a child on TV, but it kind of ends there where it's not just like for fundraising because you're really giving um the 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 activists a means of starting to becoming active for individual animals right well that's yeah that is primarily the goal of this campaign in addition to helping these animals and getting them out or you know maybe even ending the research like we're trying to do in ohio right now but beagle freedom is beagle freedom project has always had this problem and it's a problem most shelters and rescue groups would love and it's a supply and demand problem we have a supply of people and applicants and people across the country, supporters that want to adopt and help these animals in laboratories. We have that demand. We just don't have the supply of dogs to give them. So we decided why wait until the dogs and cats are freed to adopt them to these people that want to help them. Let them help them now while they're still in the laboratories. And it's a way of engaging our supporters and offering them a firsthand look at what we see and experience every day when we try to negotiate with labs, try to dissect the research that they're producing, the frustration, the arrogance that comes from them, and let them see it firsthand. Because Beagle Freedom Project isn't just about write us a check and we'll do the rest. We are a small grassroots nonprofit organization, national in scope, but really focused on um, elevating the level of participation from our supporters that seems like an awesome way to to really get like, heavily get involved especially if you have never done it before or if you've been like super nervous about writing letters or doing requests before it seems like you're, you're giving that footwork and the, the the needed push to help people do that that's really amazing yeah and the laboratories hate it because like i said for the first time you know we're having just the general public people who up until this point, we're moved by a video or, you know, started on the process of becoming a cruelty-free shopper. Now they're in the trenches with us and they understand our frustration when we reach out to labs and we are told to essentially, you know, buzz off, for lack of a better word, um, you know, to mind our own business, that this doesn't concern you. When it's our taxpayer dollars funding this, and it's ostensibly supposed to be for our benefit, but yet they won't talk about it because these labs hate transparency. And so for the first time, the normal public gets to experience this firsthand and be disrespected by these researchers who are taking money from these very people and being told, no, mind your own business. You don't get to know what we're doing with your dollars for dogs you help buy. And it's been eye-opening for them. So what, what got the Beagle Freedom Project really started? Beagle Freedom Project was formed in late 2010. And our parent nonprofit is called Animal Rescue Media and Education, ARMY. And it's been around for about 10 years. It is a shelter, non, it's a shelter rescue organization that specializes in helping special needs and senior dogs and cats and other animals in county shelters or city shelters. And in 2010, a Southern California laboratory reached out to Army and said, hey, we don't know if you can help, but we have these two experimentally spent beagles that we can't recycle into another research project. And the holidays are coming and we don't want to pay our staff time and a half to take care of them during the holiday break. So would you take them? Otherwise, we're going to euthanize them. 
And so Army said, of course, we'll take them. We specialize in hard to place animals. We'll take them. And Shannon Keith, who is the president of Army, you know, she's born and bred in Hollywood. Her dad used to direct movies. So she's got movies in her bloodstream. And when she got these two beagles from a laboratory and she decided, you know what, I'm going to film this. This is a unique experience watching dogs see freedom for the first time, see the grass, see the outside, the sunshine. So I'm going to film this and see what happens. And what she captured on video surprised her and most people. It wasn't these dogs bounding out of their cages, so excited to play. It was dogs literally bewildered by the world, the vastness of it, the texture of grass they'd never experienced, being able to finally interact with each other. And the video captured just how atrophied their muscles were. The fact that when they came out, they couldn't walk for very long without becoming exhausted because their world for their entire lives up until this point was simply a stainless steel cage with graded floors. They'd never really been walked or exercised. And so this video went viral and Army decided that this is a great, novel, unique way of elevating a public conversation about animal testing in a way no other organization is by simply letting the survivors, those victims of laboratories, those survivors that come out be the ambassadors and the little spokesman animals for all those animals still step in, stuck in cages. They could be living reminders that they're not just a petri dish or a test tube. They're dogs and cats no different than the ones 60 million Americans share their homes with. Since 2010 and that rescue in the December of 2010, we've now rescued over 500 animals from laboratories in 35 states in six countries, the majority of which are beagles, and that's why we're, our program is called the Beagle Freedom Project, because about 95% of the 65,000 dogs used in U.S. laboratories are beagles. They're the breed of choice precisely for the same reason that they make great family companions. They're very gentle, docile, people-pleasing, very forgiving. They don't bite. And this is the reason laboratories aren't using Rottweilers and pit bulls. They're preying upon these vulnerabilities, and it's really upsetting, and it speaks to a large volume of people, and that's why Beagle Freedom Project has blown up over the last couple of years. And it's also had the adverse reaction now where laboratories loathe what we do, and they hate that they think we're using their dogs as propaganda against their work. And to a large extent, they're right. We are using the dogs, they're not their dogs, to remind the public that this still happens because the number one reaction people have when they see one of our videos online or they see one of the dogs in any number of the 35 states and communities and they get to meet one of these beagles firsthand and they see that tattoo in the ear, and their first reaction and the most common reaction is, what? This is still happening? Wasn't this banned? And so it's a great reminder that no, this wasn't banned. There's 65,000 used annually, and they're still used for everything from academic curiosities, from toxicology testing, to testing for household products and cosmetics, whether that be Viagra, Latisse, the eyelash thickener, you know, certain coffee sweeteners like Splenda tested on beagles. And it reminds the public that this still happens. This is why it's important that you are a cruelty-free consumer. You always check for that label that says not test on animals. And additionally, you support legislation that increases resources and funding for alternatives. You know, one of the things we've talked about on the show um, quite, quite a bit, actually, is that when looking at the a little bit of the, the history of the animal rights movement here in, in the United States, is that it seemed like going in from the early 90s, it really focused it heavily on like like vivisection and furriers. Going through like the early 2000s, there was kind of a, a focus switched more on veganism as a lifestyle and a health choice and the dietary aspects of it. And right now, I feel like we're we're seeing another pendulum swinging back with another large focus on vivisection again. Do you, do you kind of agree with that? I mean, I personally hope so, because um, I, I think it's such an important issue. 
You might be right. I, you're probably a better student of animal rights history than myself. Um, I hope so, too. I think there needs to be more focus on animals used in testing. It's one that it's an it's a message that I know from firsthand experience that resonates with the general public, no matter where they stand on veganism or vegetarianism, that the abuse of animals they can easily identify with and empathize with because they share their homes with them. It resonates with them and it compels p compassion in them. It compels activism in them. And I know from our experience, my previous experience doing a campaign against the laboratory out in New Jersey and England, and then with Beagle Freedom Project, that the conversion rate to veganism from the start with dogs and cats and animal testing is incredibly high. You know, these dogs and cats in this issue of their torture in laboratories for things like coffee sweeteners gets the ball rolling. It's that foot in the door for people to start examining their own lives and why they care about dogs but not pigs. Because if they undertake that study, they will eventually go vegetarian or vegan. Beagle Freedom Project and Army is a vegan organization. We support animal rights and we encourage all our supporters. At any event you go to, we only have a vegan food. Anytime we do something at a restaurant, it has to be a vegan restaurant. And we support all of our people, no matter where they are on that journey about caring for animals and being conscious of their suffering, that there's always a starting point. And that starting point can be caring about beagles because you grew up with one or you love Snoopy, you know, the quintessential American dog. But we always challenge them to continue thinking more broadly about how they can reduce suffering and embrace an ethic that encompasses compassion for all animals. I read once like a statistic that most of the beagles are actually killed after they're tested on. What's the what's the 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 normal rate between how many are killed and how many are actually released? It's it's hard to say. Uh, our research specialists um, could probably answer that better, but from our experience, it's about ten percent of the dogs. Anyways, cats are probably a lot lower. Probably about three or four percent, but about 10 percent of the dogs used in research are not required to be euthanized for necropsy or cell and tissue studies when the research is done. That doesn't mean that they're not still killed, though, or they're not recycled into another research project, because that's more common. Mm -hmm. um, the numbers that we can get out of laboratories about release rates are we can't really put a number on because it's something that these laboratories aren't required to report to the USDA or the FDA or to the NIH. So they, they can keep records or they don't have to. You know, being vegan, one of the things that I get asked all the time, and I'm sure you do, is kind of like, what's your origin? What brought you to veganism? But one of the things that I love talking to other activists about is what's your origin with activism? Like, what was your first like foray into activism when really what really pushed you to take that first step into it into activism well yeah. i'll tell you my experience was i started in high school and i went to a catholic preparatory school and i didn't i was in a anatomy and biology class and i didn't want to do the dissection and so i had a great teacher and he's like well you can watch these videos instead and so i watched the videos and he said if you're into this and you have compassion for animals um, I've got these other videos provided to us by PETA, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, about animal testing. And it was one of those videos where they show the beagles um, enduring the smoking experiments where they have the nozzle strapped to their muzzles and they have to inhale smoke in a toxicology test for cigarettes. And it shook me because I was a kid that grew up with the beagle. Barney the beagle is my best friend as a little kid. I grew up with them. And those images really provoked me and resonated with me, and it led me to watching other videos by PETA and becoming a PETA member and getting involved in activism. When I was in high school, I joined this uh, organization called the Student Organization for Animal Rights at my local university, and I ended up going to that university precisely because I wanted to be a part of that student animal rights group. And I knew that this was an issue, a social justice issue, that was underrepresented in the public that needed more voices. And it was one I was passionate about. 
And it was that exposure to beagles in laboratories. Ironically enough, here I am 20 years later working for an organization called Beagle Freedom Project that started me on that journey and made me question assumptions and led me to resources. Like I read Diet for New America by John Robbins, and I immediately went vegan after that. And I couldn't get enough. I was consuming every book and video and pamphlet that I could get my hands on because it was just so shocking to me how level, how naive I had been to how widespread violence was towards animals in our society and why, I, why hadn't I been more conscious of this, more critical of it? And it just, it really resonated with me. I love it when people bring up Diet for New America. It's one of the, the books that really had a strong influence on me as well. But you can it, you can really tell when people got introduced to it because it's a very generational thing. Um, mm-hmm. People in the last 10 years so much don't know too much about it and you know unless they hear old people like me talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> and me, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, but I still think it's a great book. I, I mean, it's amazing. Yeah, I like it too. I probably wouldn't reread it today, but... At the time, it really was Mm mind-blowing. And I read recently um, Eating Animals by Jonathan Saffron Foy, Mm -hmm. however you say his last name. And that was the same kind of book to me. Like that's, to me, this generation's diet for a new America. I don't know how widely read it is, but to me, it was written in a modern voice and in a style that could appeal to a new generation of people that needed their eyes open to just how horrendous factory farms are in the consumption of animals is to our health, to the earth, and most importantly, to those animals whose bodies are taken from them. You know, I haven't read that one. Is, would you recommend it to people who are already like well down the path as, as well as just people like starting, starting their path? For sure. You know, I'd been vegan for almost 20 years when I read it, and it was still really insightful for me. And I got a lot out of it particularly with respect to aquatic life and um, how, how decimated the oceans are, the scraping of the ocean floors, mm-hmm. what we're doing to the largest bodies of water on the earth and the life inside of them simply so we can have popcorn shrimp at Red Lobster or a filet of fish sandwich. And to me, it was really, you know, I'm vegan, so I didn't eat fish anyways. But it gave me a level of insight and deeper knowledge about just how horrible um, the fishing industry really is. And I think that's something a lot of vegans need to be more educated on and more well-spoken about. You know, you know, fishing is one of the few things that I know the basics of the basics about the industry but not enough to get into a conversation with anyone who actually knows the industry very well. Sure. I think that's common amongst most animal rights activists. Mm. I feel the the same way though with vivisection though. I have, I have a really hard time getting into the nitty gritty with vivisection. Um, I think on the, the moral ground, I'm very, very solid. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't have a problem with that. But when they start getting into the deep scientific stuff with it, then I'm just like, well, that's kind of above my head. I want to stay on this this moral ground aspect here. That's that to me. That's one of the problems we face when we're we're confronting vivisection is that there's a lack of confidence, not only from activists like yourself, but the general public, because they don't feel that they can converse with scientists, that they're not allowed to be skeptical. They're not allowed to be critical simply because the terminology isn't our everyday layman terminology. But when you confront the public with just hard statistics about the efficacy of animal testing, it speaks to them. Mm -hmm. The fact that 92% of all the drugs that pass through phase one animal, I'm sorry, pass through animal studies as safe fail in phase one human clinical trials. That's a 92% failure rate. You'd have greater chances by flipping a coin. So that's the kind of statistics that the public doesn't, you don't need to argue with an animal tester using scientific jargon and words like tell, you know, uh, uh, stereotaxic devices and things like that. 
where you can just argue about the efficacy of what they're producing and that there's got to be a better way. A 92% failure rate isn't good enough. And questioning it doesn't make you anti-science. You know, I had a grandfather that died of Parkinson's, a grandmother that died of Alzheimer's. My best friend as a child died of brain cancer. I watched the tumor literally push out his eye socket. We all want there to be cures to these diseases, but the animal models are failing us. If you're studying feline leukemia, you don't use an elephant as a model. You use a cat. And it's the same thing with human health. You know, to me, poisoning my dog, Junior, who spent five years in a laboratory as a test subject, helps nobody. He's got, he walks on four legs. He's got a different circulatory system. He can go drink from a puddle on the street and not get sick, whereas if I did that, I'd be violently ill. They're different bodies. It requires a different methodology. And like you're saying, it's just that confidence level of people feeling intimidated by big words. But at the end of the day, it's the numbers that count. And that being said, I do encourage everybody to read books and educate themselves uh, about the critique of animal studies. You know, Dr. Greek's book is one of my favorites of Sacred Cows and Golden Geese. Um, because he's somebody that did animal testing. He is a doctor, he is a scientist, and he lays out a criticism of this methodology for research based on the science, not on the ethics or soft fuzzy feelings about dogs and cats. So um, besides his book, what other resources would you, you give activists to, to gain that confidence to, that they would have in, in other areas of animal activism? Yeah, I I'd sometimes hesitate about prescribing, uh, recommending particularly books on animal testing because books become very dated these days. And so I encourage people, you know, in 21st century, 2015, it's a social media culture. It's a very digital culture. There are any host of organizations out there that have a social media or website presence that offer white papers, critiques, um, commentaries and alternatives. They fund alternatives. And that goes from anywhere from U.S.-based organizations like Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicines to organizations like one of my favorite is Dr. Hadwin's Trust in the U.K. And they put their money where their mouth is and fund scientists who are pioneering more accurate ways of developing research that can find cures to diseases without animal models. You mentioned trust in the UK, is that right? Dr. Hadwin's trust. Dr. Hadwin's I'm not familiar with that. Would you mind going into that a little bit more? Sure. Hang on, let me just shut my window. Sorry about that. Our neighbor likes to park in front and play music. <laughs> um, yeah, Dr. Hadwin's trust is a UK-based science organization that was developed by a gentleman, a researcher, a scientist named Dr. Hadwin. And it's a trust, so it's a fund that specifically funds young and upcoming scientists and breakthrough research that doesn't involve animal models as a, to essentially prove to the industry that's so steeped in tradition and old ways and convenience and the cottage industry that surrounds animal testing where it's very profitable, to rethink their approach to how they do basic research and advanced research. And if they'll choose to eschew animal-based models, this organization, Dr. Hadwin's Trust, will help back them up financially. That's, that's pretty amazing. Yeah, and there's a, there's a host of organizations out there that do this, and... I think it's becoming more commonplace, especially on campuses. Sadly, though, in the United States, at least, all drugs, all medical devices are required by the FDA to be tested on animals. So even if you have a researcher at a school or at a pharmaceutical company that thinks, you know, poisoning rats, then rabbits, then dogs, then primates is a stupid model, they still have to do it because it's required by law. And, and it's how, tragic. And it's one of the things that Beagle Freedom Project has on its long-term agenda as we take a more robust legislative approach 
to challenging animal testing. Now it's it is only medical, right? It's it doesn't extend into cosmetics because that's no a cosmetics. Myth. Cosmetics and certain household products are not required to be tested on animals. Sadly, many U.S. based companies still choose to, and they choose to out of convenience, and this is what they've always done. And also because a lot of these companies, you know, we live in a globalized market. They don't just want to sell to the U.S. consumer base. They want access to the billions of new consumers in China. And unfortunately, China requires all cosmetics, all household products have to be tested on animals. And so these companies choose to do that. And therefore, we can't consider them cruelty free. I was I, I did not know that China required all cosmetics to be tested. Yeah, they do. Um, there's some word there's there's word in Chinese politics that they may amend this policy at the next Communist Congress, uh, the Chinese People's Congress, to revisit whether or not this is required. But as of right now, it is. So companies that were on the verge of no longer testing on animals, those old perennial favorites we used to hate back in the 90s and 80s, like CoverGirl and Maybelline and Revlon and L'Oreal, most of them don't we're, probably would be considered cruelty free companies right now because they don't they have alternatives they use alternatives to you know bring their products to the market and the research and development process but because they want access to that chinese market they are complying with this demand that they test their products on animals that's just so how do we how do we as activists fight this i mean there's obviously legislation and stuff like that but well the europeans have banned it and so a lot of these companies are now going to have to choose between wanting access to the european marketplace or the chinese marketplace but sadly there's going to always be more consumers in the chinese marketplace just based mm -hmm. on their uh, demographics and population sizes um in the u.s we still haven't banned cosmetic testing on animals and household products. That's something that's been in the works for several years. Um, unfortunately, our big national groups that support this legislation don't have um, a strong legislative presence on Capitol Hill in DC. We're hoping that changes. Um, but also organizations like Beagle Freedom Project. You know, we have a smartphone app called Cruelty Cutter and it's the most up-to-date and biggest compilation of companies that do and do not test on animals. And it's in a smartphone app where you go to a store and you scan the UPC or the GPC code on a shampoo or a makeup or a household cleaner, and it'll instantly tell you on the spot if that product was tested on animals or not, versus the old way where you'd have to like scroll through several screens looking for your company to see if it's owned by another company, if it's tested on animals or not. And it was just too much to ask people as they're standing in a cosmetics aisle in Target or Macy's or something like that. And so ours gives you that instant determination. And then also it allows you to take action on the spot. So if your product you scanned is tested on animals, you can instantly share your protest that you're not going to buy this product and tell all your friends. Or if it is cruelty free, you can instantly socially share on Twitter, or Facebook or Pinterest. Um, your praise for the company that they have, they are cruelty free and you're supporting for this reason. And then for geeks like myself, the backend analytics are proving really helpful for us. Um, we have a social media fiscal valuation on every scan and social share uh, with a complicated algorithm that applies a value to it, a financial value to these actions. And so at the end of the year, Beagle Freedom Project, which is a shareholder in several of these companies like Procter & Gamble and Johnson & Johnson and S.E. Johnson and IAMS, we can go to their annual general meeting and say, from our app alone, and that's just our app, we can show you the hard numbers you can't argue with that you lost X millions of dollars in market share and this much per dividend because you still choose to test on animals and sell in the Chinese market. So is this worth it? Because ultimately, if they're not going to listen to the philosophical argument, the ethical argument, the scientific argument, we're hoping they listen to the financial argument. 
And up until now with this backend analytics on our app, we haven't been able to demonstrably prove to them just how much they are losing in market share. That's why I love Cruelty Cutter just for that. It's also a really fun app to use when you're in a store. It gets really addictive just to see what's cruelty free and what's not. Yeah, I had no idea about the back backend analytics with it, but those analytics truly make it like an, an amazing fighting tool that it just, just isn't really out there. No, nobody else has it. And our app too is constantly updated. It's got access to 30 million products around the world that can be scanned with our app. And I believe our database is the most comprehensive. It's taken the Leaping Bunny database. It's taken the PETA database. It took the BUAV, the Cruelty Free International database of companies that do and do test on animals. And we've expanded beyond it. We have one employee who works 30 hours a week just keeping this this um, list updated because it changes a lot. Companies are sold. Policies change. Some go cruelty free. Some resume testing because they're you know they're now selling in the Chinese market. And we want this app to be a living, breathing instrument for the public to be confident that they're getting the most up to date information and that they can vote with their dollars about which companies they support based on these values. It's funny when you said you could do it the old way and you said went to scroll, my mind went call a company and write them a yes. letter. <laughs> well, there are a couple other apps out there that allow you like the cruelty, the, the, the leaping bunny app, which, you know, is great. I have it. Um, but you have to sit there and literally like type in the name of the product. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's a product that's owned by a company that's owned by a bigger company. So you, you know, it takes quite a bit of time standing there or like scrolling through pages. You know, I remember since I'm older, back when I was in college in the 90s, and I would get the PETA, these little pocket, pocket booklets mm -hmm. that folded out like an accordion. And it literally had like 100 products tested on animals on one side and then 100 products that are cruelty free on the other side. And you'd go into a store and you'd pull out your giant leaflet trying to find out if the shampoo you're buying is okay or not. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I couldn't find the product on the list. I'm just like, well, yeah. one in doubt, go without. <laughs> and then, that's why I love with the cruelty, with our app, Cruelty Cutter, because if you scan the product and we don't have a testing determination in our database because it's a new product to us, we get the push notification on our end and our employee instantly reaches out to the company, gets the determination and upstate the, updates the app within a couple of hours. That's awesome. That's amazing. So that way, yeah, that's yeah, amazing. all the users are helping build a solid database for us by constantly finding these products. That right there should, should make you want to use it more just because it helps the community even more the more you use it. That's really amazing. Yeah, no question. That's, we, we can't tell people enough. Yeah, it's important that you download the app and our app is, we do, we do charge for it. Um, but don't just download it just because it's nice to have. The utility of it and the importance of it comes from those scans. Mm -hmm. A, it, yeah, it helps the community and builds the database. And then B, every scan you do and every social share you do gives me that back-end analytics, that data that I can present when I show up to the AGMs and I stand up there and I make a shareholder resolution for them to end animal testing based on the research we're providing. It, it reminds me uh, of the days when you have to you used to have to carry around anim, animal ingredients A to Z. Yeah, you're constantly flipping from page to page. <laughs> oh, I forgot about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. How do these share meetings typically go? Well, we haven't gone to one yet because we just hard launched the app. Um, we did a soft launch uh, in January, February, and we hard launched it in, I believe, April. And so we're going to give it a full calendar year and then start presenting at the AGMs next year. So, so what you're saying is that it's super critical that people get that data in now. Yep. And we really want everybody using this app. So our organization finally just set a marketing budget. We're going to start advertising this thing. Um, we're revisiting the price point on it because we really do need more people using it everywhere. And it's an app that's usable no matter where you are in the world. 
Um, it doesn't matter what language you're scanning, it reads the barcode, the UPC or the GPC barcode, and that is a universal language for companies. So one of the things that I love to talk to, to other activists about is what right now in the movement would you like to see happening that just isn't happening as, as much as you wish? Oh, wow. Well, um, I don't know if I have a great answer for that. I just want more. I want more <laughs> of everything. And okay, honestly, though, I'll tell you what I like. As an animal rights activist that's been doing and participating with organizations and causes since 1995, I love organizations and activists that approach their issue, and I don't care what issue it is in the animal rights spectrum, but they approach it with creativity. I hate it when organizations just simply recycle what everybody else is doing, you know, and you see these trends and these fads from like, you know, I loved it when Patty Mark in Australia did open rescues and then everybody jumped on board and they're doing open rescues until mm -hmm. it lost its utility. And, you know, the pay-per-view videos, you see at all the veg festas and college fairs where you're paying somebody a dollar to watch a video. You know, these are all creative ideas. We need more ideas like this, not just constantly redoing what other organizations do. And that's why I like Beagle Freedom Project. Like, this is new. It's not new, really. It's essentially recycling what created the modern animal rights movement, but it was updating it for our generation. It's telling the stories of survivors from animal testing to provoke a conversation with the public, encourage a cruelty-free lifestyle, and encourage a conversion to embracing a broader animal rights ethic. We need more things like that, new creative ideas. You know, it, it, it kind of goes on with what I personally like to see more of. And, and I thankfully, I would say in the last like year and a half, you're seeing it more and more, which is uh, a true rise of grassroots activism. I, mm -hmm. I feel like um, activism for a while got kind of taken over by just huge national campaigns. And not that they're they doing anything wrong, but I think we see a lot more... Uh, a lot more work done when, when you get on that local grassroots, grassroots level. Oh, there's no question. If, if you're doing it with your group of friends or supporters in your community over an issue that's local, you're going to work so much harder than if a national group sends out an e-blast saying, hey, can you sign a petition or can you send us a check? That's not empowering. Doing it yourself is empowering. And that's why the, the identity campaign was a byproduct of Beagle Freedom Project trying to figure out how do we translate all these supporters that want to do something, but not just tell them to send us a check. And don't get me wrong, we still want that check. You know, we're, <laughs> we're a nonprofit organization that is on a shoestring budget, but we want them to do more than just support financially. You know, be active yourself in your community or on a national stage, come up with ideas. I'm I'm really hoping that that as a movement we're getting over the hump of technology. So what I mean is kind of like um, as technology's increased and people have been communicating more and more online. I think um, the term armchair activism kind of took over. But I see that I feel like we're kind of passing that hump through where now we're figuring out how to utilize all that technology even more and taking the activism and combining it with the technology and moving it to the next level. I agree. You know, back in our day, you know, activism meant holding a placard, you know, mm -hmm. going to Kinko's and photocopying flyers mm -hmm. and handing them out at demonstrations and maybe even getting arrested in civil disobedience. And, you know, I'm nostalgic for some of those days and we made important victories and progress and moved the needle on many animal issues. And I'm, ex I'm even more excited now because you know, I'm no longer in the trenches of that. And I see some of these grassroots activists that their activism isn't what I was doing. It is more digitally based, like you're talking about. And it's novel, it's creative, and it's catching our opposition in the animal industries by surprise. Mm -hmm. And I love it. You know, no, you talk about being nostalgic back for the day. I got to tell you, I, I actually, I know you won't remember this at all, but I met you one time at a, a protest in New Jersey, as a national protest in New Jersey. And I remember thinking at the time, like, that's the kind of activist I want to be. Like, you, you, were, <laughs> you were truly inspiring. And I just wanted to let you know that. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I, I'm, I, have, I appreciate that. That, doesn't, that does mean a lot to me. 
Um, I'm not sure how inspiring it was to people when I was put in jail, though. <laughs> I don't know if anybody wanted to be me at that point. Is that something you, you, you mind going into a little bit or do you kind of want to want to stay away from that? No, I'm on probation. I can talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, so so do you mind telling people really, really what that was with for you? Sure. Um, you know, in the late 90s, early 2000s, I was participating in a campaign against this product testing laboratory called Huntington Life Sciences, which has a big main facility in Huntington, England, and then a second facility in the United States in uh, East Millstone, New Jersey. And I was living in England when this campaign started. And after college, I moved to England um, through, I had a visa through the British University North American Connection to study and work there. And I became involved with animal rights campaigns because in the late 90s in England, they were really aggressive, confident, and victorious in many of their campaigns against animal testing and the fur industry. And it was an inspirational place to be. And during my tenure there, the Shack campaign, Stop Hunting to Animal Cruelty, started to shut down this world's biggest CRO, contract research organization, that had been exposed in multiple undercover investigations showing workers punching beagles in the face, cutting open primates while they're not only still alive, but somewhat conscious, um, just producing really terrible research. Uh, it was a terrible company. And so... I was a participant in a grassroots campaign called Stop Hunting to Animal Cruelty, whose sole goal was to shut down this laboratory. And the method chosen by the organization, SHAT, was to not necessarily try to convince the workers of the lab who are punching the dogs in the face that they're bad news and they should stop, but by convincing those companies that the lab needed to survive to divest because they didn't need the lab to make money. And it was modeled on the South African bank boycott campaign to protest and bring down the apartheid government there in the 80s. And so that same model was chosen. And again, it was a new, creative, innovative approach to targeting your opposition. And it really spoke to me, this idea of secondary or tertiary targeting to defund and undercut the pillars of support this lab needed to stay afloat. And it was amazingly successful. While I participated in it in the UK and in the US, where we literally got Huntington Life Sciences kicked off the London Stock Exchange, the New York Stock Exchange, the NASDAQ, the over-the-counter bulletin board. And they were literally suspended and frozen on the pink sheets, often called the penny sheets, um, where they had no market makers to trade their stock, no stockbrokers to make a market for them, investors that were dumping their shares by the hundreds of thousands at a penny each because they wanted nothing to do with it, banks that were closing their facilities and not giving them any checking supply, insurance companies that wouldn't underwrite them in case any accidents happen in the lab, even their toilet paper supplier pulled the plug on them. And so this campaign ran for a number of years, and it was truly grassroots in nature. There was not one single person, myself included, that participated in this campaign on both sides of the, the ocean that was a paid staff member that had a pension or a health insurance fund through the organization. It was truly grassroots, and it was funded and run by volunteers that legitimately wanted to see this lab shut down and were taking action on their own. Shaq would put out a list of companies that were investors or supporters of the labs and people across the world, above ground and underground activists, would choose how they wanted to protest this company and convince them to pull the plug on Huntington. Some people wrote letters, some people did demonstrations, some people broke windows and took dogs out of labs or, you know, painted slogans on the homes of bank executives that were making a lot of money off of their shares in this lab. And it had this amazing effect through the grassroots movement. Ultimately, there was a price to pay. You know, you can't be that successful against a, the biggest contract research organization in the world and against the CRO that most of the major pharmaceutical companies use. And, you know, pharmaceutical companies are a $300 billion a year industry and have mm. two lobbyists 
for every member of Congress in D.C., and that doesn't even count the state capitals where they also have lobbyists, before that kind of power, that kind of influence catches up to you. And unfortunately, the United States federal government uh, decided to bring charges against myself and five others that were participants in the campaign in the U.S. Um, for our leadership roles and organizing to shut down Huntington Life Sciences. And they brought charges against us in, I believe, 2004, and they charged us under uh, the Animal Enterprise Protection Act, later amended to be called the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act, because after 9-11, that's more cachet and the appropriate thing to do if you're trying to demonize activism. And these were in the heydays of, you know, Bush's dark years when the Patriot Act was in place and people didn't really care about civil liberties, especially the First Amendment. And so we were charged under the Animal Enterprise, Animal Enterprise Protection Act and then several counts of interstate stalking because we ran a website, a facility in interstate commerce that published the names and home addresses of several people that were becoming rich for supporting Huntington Life Sciences or were decision makers and companies that were making money supporting Huntington Life Sciences. And we were charged because we put their names and contact information on a website and people across the country, unknown third parties, um, took action against them. 90% of the action in the Shack campaign was all legal and above board from demonstrations and letter writing and petitions and phone calls and emails. But then 10% was illegal direct action. People taking, breaking the law to prove a point. Um, and history is rife with examples of direct action supporting social justice causes, and this was no different. And we were charged with uh, essentially, um, for lack of a better word, inciting direct action against people listed on our website because we published their information and then we republished the reports afterwards about what happened. And because we were not sympathetic to the plight of the people protested, but sympathetic to the plight of the animals that were being protested for, we were goading people on to um, kind of paraphrase the government's argument against us. Um, we found the case to be patently unconstitutional. We have every right to do this. We still think we do. And that the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act, the Animal Enterprise Protection Act, um, is an unconstitutional law in and of itself because it criminalizes your politics. I could do everything that I did in the Shack campaign against child labor, against the war in Iraq, against environmental destruction, and it would have been, it would have been legal. But because we did it for animals, and there is this thing called the Animal Enterprise Protection Act passed in 92, therefore it was illegal. And so we challenged it and we took it to trial um, twice. The first trial was a mistrial and the second trial, unfortunately we were convicted not by a jury of our peers, but by a jury of degenerates from New Jersey, which is America's medicine cabinet. So it's got the highest concentration of pharmaceutical companies in the, in the country. And everybody on that jury was prejudiced against us from the get-go because, A, they either knew somebody that worked in a pharmaceutical or they did themselves, and, B, from the outset, they were told, you're going to be an anonymous jury. Don't worry. These people will never be able to find you. Before they even heard one thing about the case, we were the first case in New Jersey that had an anonymous jury that wasn't a mob trial. So we were set up from failure from the start, which is unfortunate. And sadly, our judge was from, she was appointed to the federal bench in the 70s. Um, I'm sure she's a nice lady in her personal life, but she really failed to grasp constitutional issues with respect to 21st century matters like internet technology. Um, I think she probably still used a typewriter, sadly. And unfortunately, we lost that trial. And as a result, we were all sentenced to prison. I was the president of Shack, and so I received the most amount of time, and I spent five years in federal prison. And I got out in 2011 and just got a probation in January of this year. It was a long road. Yes, it is. Um, one of the things that we, we talk to our listeners about all the time is the importance of supporting political prisoners um, through any means necessary, including things like writing and things like that. Um, would you mind like, maybe going into a little bit about that yourself? 
I probably am not the best person to like have, be a spokesperson for people in prison because quite honestly, yes, it's important to support our political prisoners. If we're not supporting our political prisoners, this cause is lost. And that's a famous quote from Keith Mann, an old animal liberation front activist um, from the UK. And it's the truth. It's the vitality of our movement that when one of our own is prosecuted slash persecuted, we need to stand in unison and speak up for him or her. Um, my own personal experience of being a political prisoner was, though, um, I didn't want all the letters, to be honest with you. They didn't help me psychologically. Um, I wanted just to read, get healthy, exercise, make friends, and get the most out of my time in prison and not being constantly reminded by where people are going on vacation, what amazing cookbook they just got. <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff wore on my psychology. I just wanted to get on with my time in prison mm -hmm. and better myself in different ways. Now, that's why I'm not a good example, because I know a lot of political prisoners, including my co-defendants, really thrived on that access to the outside world. And those letters that would come in was a lifeline that sustained them when they were down. Um, I'm more internal focused. You know, I'm an introvert by nature. I like to be introspective and that's where I drive my own energy from. So I don't know if I'm a good spokesperson to really expound upon letters saved my life because they didn't. Uh, about a year and a half, two years into my prison sentence, I asked people to literally please stop writing me letters, take my name off your sites. This isn't helping me. It's making me depressed. <laughs> you know, but I think that that speaks volumes as to why we need to actually listen to, the, to those individuals and, mm -hmm. and, you know, follow what they need. Because like you say, everyone's a little bit different. No question. In, including yeah. post-release. Yeah, including post-release. Exactly. Especially I think that's I think that's one of the places that as a movement we failed tremendously in the past, but we're getting a lot better at it now is the post-release um, aspect of things. Yeah, I 100% agree. Post-release, because, um, you know, again, when I got out of prison, I wasn't really out of prison. I was on probation. For the mm -hmm. first six months, I was under halfway house restrictions where literally I had an ankle bracelet on, which is really degrading. Um, I never got a solid six hours of sleep for an entire six months because I would be called twice between midnight and 6 a.m., to make sure I am where I am in my home and I had to repeat a series of numbers back to them. And, you know, finding a job post-release as a felon is rather tricky. Um, and just acclimating back to a life with your family and friends, uh, it's hard. It's, it's hard in terms of resources that you don't have and you may have some pride and you don't want to ask for help. And then it's just hard emotionally too because – so much of the world goes by that, you know, when I, when you're in prison, you're kind of in a time warp. Time mm -hmm. stands stills for you. And when I got out, everything had changed. You know, the advent of smartphones, um, just, just the culture, how people dressed. You know, obviously in prison, you watch TV and you read the newspapers. So you're not ignorant to buy what's happening in the world, but it's another thing to be observing it than it is to be participating in it. Mm -hmm. And it does take people a little bit of time. It took me anyways, a little bit of time to catch up. You know, I was still like dressing the same way I had eight years prior. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> I didn't realize, not that I cared, but just like how out of fashion I was because I had no idea. <laughs> it was like one of those silly things that was pointed out to me, like that's not what we wear anymore. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, a very interesting conversation to have with somebody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you have a lot of those weird little conversations. Is, is there any other one that kind of sticks out in your mind? Um, conversation, no. But I'll tell you the worst thing for me. <laughs> and I, worst thing for me, like I get out of prison and you're still not really done with it, especially the six months that you're in your halfway house restrictions. Mm -hmm. Although after like, Two months, I finally got to move back to my home and be there, even though I'm being called twice a day between midnight and 6 a.m. Um, you know, I was still being breathalyzed because I could never have a drink. And to me, that was the hardest part uh, because 
I am a very healthy drinker. I like to imbibe. And there was one thing when you're in prison and it's just, it's really not, it's always an option. You can drink in prison. You know, people are always making hooch. And if you wanted to have drugs, you could, it's available. But to me, my freedom and getting out and rejoining my family, my friends and a, a, a political movement I support was more important. But it was those six months I was on halfway house restrictions and you'd go to a restaurant and you'd have a martini right in front of your face and you couldn't even sip it. And you were, you're constantly reminded every meal and every time you're with your friends and they do get to have a drink that you're not truly free. You still are a prisoner. And that was hard. That temptation was really hard. You know, that's an aspect that I, I've never really heard before. And I couldn't even imagine how ha just hard that is because it's like that brink of freedom, that, that, that taste of it, but not really there. Yeah, you're on the cusp of it. Yeah. You're right on the cusp of it. Yeah, you can taste it, but you can't fully, you can't eat it. <laughs> just just that knowing that must just wear down on you, psych, you know, psychologically every day. It does, yeah. It's an exhausting period, and you keep thinking, I kept thinking to myself, oh, is this ever going to end? Is this ever going to end? And then it did. And I was like, mm -hmm. yes, this is done. But then I still had three years of probation mm -hmm. and checking in once a month with a probation officer. And a whole array and host of other degradations I care not to expound upon that reminds you you're still not truly free. And then you think, is this ever going to finish? Oh, my gosh, can I get through three years of this, of having my life micromanaged, my opinion second guess, being afraid to be vocal, too vocal about my opinions? Because that's what put me in prison to begin with, mm -hmm. was exercising my First Amendment rights to say, I hate animal testing and I support direct action and I'm glad it happens. And literally that's kind of the, the, <laughs> sorry, that's Raymond and Jr. of our two beagles being fed. That is the reason that I essentially went to jail. So it was hard those three years. Did, did you ever like think that it would stop you from being an activist? No, no, I didn't. You know, this is my calling in life. I believe in it. I'll always find some way to participate in it. You know, I may not always have the honor of having it be my full-time job, which is a really special thing, but I'll always be a participant in activism in some capacity. And animal testing has always been the issue that resonates the most with me. You know, even though I've been vegan for 20 years and I support friends that work at Farm Sanctuary and PETA and organizations like those, it's the animal testing component that gets me up in the morning, that gets my blood boiling, that makes me pugnacious and a fighter and stubborn. And I'll probably always work on animal testing issues. And hopefully we'll see it. Successfully. Time that it ends. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, you know, thank you so much for taking your time uh, and being with us. Um, how can people follow your work, um, get the app, find, you know, and help support the Beagle? Freedom Project. Thank you. I was stumbling over my words. <laughs> no, if people would like to support Beagle Freedom Project, which I encourage you to do, and it doesn't matter where you are in life, if you're vegetarian or you're not, if you tragically think, you know, animal testing is just a sad necessity or you are morally opposed to it, Beagle Freedom Project is an organization that welcomes everybody. You just have to care about animals and you have to make that first step of being a cruelty-free consumer. So go, please go to BeagleFreedomProject.org and you can watch the videos of dogs having their first taste of freedom, the cats, the rabbits, the goats, the ponies, the pigs, the guinea pigs, the rats, even the goldfish we've rescued from laboratories across the world. And you can, you know, share them with your friends. You can easily become a cruelty-free shopper by downloading our Cruelty Cutter app. It's a smartphone app for Android and iPhones. It's called Cruelty Cutter available at both stores. Um, you can donate. You can just actually participate hands-on by signing up for our identity campaign where you can do what we do and try to literally free individual animals from laboratories by participating in our crowdsourcing of open records requests. Uh, we need everybody in all walks of life, whether you're an attorney, you're a student, you're a doctor, you're a graphic designer, uh, you're an IT person, no matter who you are, we need your help. So go to cruelty, go to uh, beaglefreedomproject.org. Well, thank you so much. Um, we end every episode saying fuck shit damn. Would you mind saying it for us this week? What? <laughs>
Really? Yeah. Why? <laughs> You're the first one to ask why. Um, this doesn't seem proper. <laughs> it's very improper. <laughs> That's kind, oh, of, kind of why. I guess. Okay. Fuck shit down. See. Is that you good? There? Yeah. Oh, did you get it? I, it actually cut. Yeah. It actually cut out on you. Uh, yeah, <laughs> not it's even joking. Because this is these are words really not my vernacular that <laughs> I use that often. Um, it feels a little like I'm a schoolboy now. Um, fuck shit, damn. Awesome. Thank awesome. you so Thank much. You so much. There you go. Uh, <laughs> okay. Thank you. Well, you have a wonderful night. You too. Thanks, guys. Okay. Uh-huh. Have a good one. Bye. 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 This week you heard Silver by Bonobo. Right now you're listening to Until Heaven Stops the Rain by Wax Taylor. Wanted to give a shout out to A Stranger Danger. Thank you so much for your kind words on iTunes. If you haven't rated and reviewed us on iTunes, please go do so. It helps out the show tremendously. I know we sound like a broken record, but it really does help us. And the more you help us, the more we can give you quality content or unquality content. Free. It's free. Free quant. Content. Free. Free. Free content. <laughs> content. <laughs> it really does help the show. It makes it easier for people to find the show. It is really what, it, what you're doing. So thank you very much. If you've already done it and you want to help us out a little bit more, yeah, you know, just pick up someone else's device. You know, walk them through the process. Be like, hey, I know this awesome show. You're going to want to listen to it. Oh, you don't know what a podcast is? Check this shit out. Boo. And then get This American Life and some other good ones. So they actually like podcasts. After. <laughs> so they actually like, you don't know what a podcast is? What are you? Older than 25? <laughs> <laughs> it's like a radio show, but for the internet. <laughs> If you haven't liked us or become our friend on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, you should do that. We will always respond, and we often post things on there that we don't talk about on the show. And by often, I mean every day, because let's face it, we're all on the internet all the time. Way too much. But we're nice, so do the little... Friendy thingy, follow thingy, whatever it's called. Like us, follow us, obey. Obey. I like the obey. Yep. And you can find all of our stuff. Go to wishsidepodcast.com. Click on the social tab. (sighs) I'm just going to come out with it, man. Fuck shit, damn. Which Side Podcast is hosted and produced by Jordan Halliday and Jeremy Parkin of the Which Side Media Collective, with web design by Jordan Halliday and sound design by Jeremy Parkin. Booking by Mari Halliday. Theme music by Commandantes. Go to wishsidecollective.org to check out the other shows in the collective. As always, fuck shit damn. <laughs>